I'm Jason Wright, president of the Washington Commanders, and you're watching Ref the District. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Ref the District's After the Whistle, where we go beyond the sports to get to know our guest. I'm Nathan, that's Trev, and that's the stoner. And we've got a doozy today, guys. We have none other than the president of the commander's organization on the non-football side of the operations. That's right. Jason Wright is coming to join us. How are you two feeling about this one? I am jacked. I'm nervous. I want to puke. I need to use the bathroom. I'm ready to go. <laughs> hey, you know how excited Trev is? Yeah. He was here 35 minutes prior to when <laughs> I'm never was. early. Like and he's that. never He's early. always coming That's in hot. And he had, a, he had a show up early for this one. Absolutely. Yeah. Showing up and showing out because... You know, I'm not even going to delay this any further, guys, because we're, you know, no one wants to listen to us three. You know, they, they're here for the man himself. It is Jason Wright. Let's give him a warm round of applause as we welcome again President Jason Wright. Mr. President, thank you for joining us here on Ref the District. I appreciate it, guys. I'm happy to be here. Now, this is your first time officially on our channel, but this isn't actually your kind of first interaction with us. In fact, you threatened to send the lawyers after us after we shared this released video. The, the three that will go through are Red Wolves, Commanders, and Monuments. I like Monuments. I really like Monuments. That's really good. Oh my so, God. Yeah. That, that feels like about two decades ago. Now. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, we've been through so much here. Uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a long time coming, and uh, and we'll definitely get to the name change a little bit and your kind of role in there. Uh, what I like that was a lot of fun for us to do, and we love the interaction with you on Twitter. You interact with the fans quite often. It seems like it's a big part of your job. You know how important is it to you to be able to interact with us? And you know, have any of these interactions kind of helped shape your decisions in the organization? Absolutely, and it's been a, a bit of an evolution. Um, uh, I think early on coming into this, it was important for us to share who we were going to become as an organization. Like we knew we had a bunch of change that we had to make. First and foremost, in the type of people that were here, in the way that we operated, the way we did business, the way the business was structured, like boring stuff that y'all don't really care about that much, mm -hmm. but are actually fundamental to having a healthy organization that can fund a championship team. Um, so I knew we had all that stuff, but it was a little bit like hope and change at the beginning. Um, and so it was important to um, be vocal about who we were going to be, show a bit of our collective personality, my particular personality as a down payment on what we would eventually accomplish in transforming the organization. So it was really important for that reason. And also it was important for us to learn. Like we all came into this cold and we had a bunch of crap that we had to do that yeah. was substantial and franchise direction changing at the time. And so getting in front of our fans and you know curating my feed on social media. So I got a mix of people that were supportive and detractors and neutral, the apathetic, the super passionate and getting that balanced view was, was really, really important. I think well, now I'm a little less active. If you know, <laughs> um, I think, you know, number one, we got a bunch of stuff that we got to do. Right. Um, and the priority of learning and, and listening has uh, been replaced by a bias towards action and um, and making rapid change uh, in various things in the business. Um, but also over time, the halo wears off and I'm not getting as good an information from <laughs> social media mm -hmm. as I used to. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you filter between the, the, the kill yourselves and like you ain't nothing. Your mama should die like that stuff. Once you get through all yeah. that. There's not that much good information left. So I'm a little less active than I used to be, but it's the right, it's the right evolution. It's the right evolution for us. But yeah. I, still, I still enjoy it when I get a moment. That's so fun. speaking of things that you you have to do here, I know you're not on the personnel side of things, right? But you have a little something called access. Yes. So if you could do us a favor, sure. if you can walk down the hall or downstairs, whatever it is, knock on Ron's door, right? And say, hey, Ron. The boys from Ref the District have said that two words will get you to the Super Bowl. Of course, Ron, right? He's he's going to turn his yeah. head. He says, there we go. Ain't, 
anything that ref says, I know those guys are on top of it. So sure. what do they say? Sure. And sure. then you just look at them real quietly and just say, Lamar Jackson. <laughs> right? Lamar Jackson. We're going so, to the chip, Jason. <laughs> so transparent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You saw it coming from my mouth. Uh, I mean, there's a non-zero chance Ron walks in. I just came from like a two-hour lunch with Ron. We probably have some follow-ups. So there's a non-zero chance he pops in here uh, right now to talk about stuff. All right. So you might get an interesting something. Um, uh, <laughs> talk, off, talk off screen. But yes, I, I will relay that information to Ron. I I don't think there's enough people saying that for him to be able to hear that loud and clear that there's, yeah. there's a certain segment that has a real bias to bring in an electric quarterback like that. So I'll, I'll make sure he knows because it might be off his radar. Don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably doesn't even know that, you know, Lamar Jackson's available. You know, yeah, yeah. He's so focused on Sam Howell right now. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring it back to reality. Yeah, Jason, please. Real quick, okay. Um, a lot of people who watch our show and are fans of the commanders might know that you had a previous career in NFL as a player for Arizona Cardinals. Um, and then you took some time off and came back. I just want to know, can you explain your journey of coming back to NFL and yeah. being here as a player and what made you to do this as this role? That's that's a great question. I think the the whole through line of my career is sort of what brought me back in a, in a strange way. I mean, I I was just talking to um, Ron about this at lunch. Um, you know, I, I came in through the back door of of the NFL. You know, I got cut nine times in my first year and a half. Uh, the first time I got fired, I came in from practice from two day practice. My name was off my locker. All my stuff was in a black trash bag and there's a yellow sticky note that said, please leave your playbook on the counter. Taxi comes for you in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now that's not how we cut players here. We do it with a bit more um, um, empathy. <laughs> you an Uber, right? Instead of a taxi. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, no, a, bit, a bit more empathy and process, sure. but, but you know, it's a, it's a business and for me, those were the first moments where I really experienced in your face failure like that. I got a lot of tough moments growing up, don't get me wrong, but my parents sort of protected me from the environment around me, made sure that I um, could just focus on school and being good at sports. And then as a college athlete, you're sort of coddled and you're protected, right? Mm -hmm. I, should, I definitely should have been kicked out of school, but I, instead I just had to run laps and volunteer. You know, the consequences weren't there for, for dumb decisions, you know? Um, and so for the first time in my life, I was faced with consequences and faced with sort of in your face failure. And that's a big defining moment. It's like, do I actually have it in me to grind and to work through that? Do I turn it down in the face of that? Do I lose my confidence? And you see a lot of guys spiral that way. And I learned during that time period when I was running out of money, living in an extended stay motel, eventually like I, I bought a car that had a really expensive gas and I, <laughs> couldn't afford my gas. So I moved in with my aunt and uncle and drove their car back and forth from the facility when I was playing for the Falcons on the practice squad. Like that whole period, I learned how to maintain my confidence when everything around me was telling me to quit and telling me that it wasn't for me. Um, I, I did it by watching my highlight film and watching it over and over again until I felt that confidence and that swagger come back. And the narrative in my mind switched from a question of do I belong to a declarative statement, I do belong. And I, I learned that early on. And then I eventually made the team in Cleveland. I won't tell all the stories. There's so many good stories along that way. I'm like so grateful to God for that. But like um, eventually made the team, stop getting fired <laughs> and, uh, and made it all the way to be a team captain and NFL player, player rep during the lockout in 2011. But it was that early grind and understanding the, the value of the business side of this and then being a player rep and seeing that the people who got the collective bargaining deal done, who made it possible for us to have this lucrative early moment in our lives where we made game changing money for our families, they're the ones who knew business. And that's why I went to business school, transitioned to this firm called McKinsey and Company, where I was a consultant. And once again, was like, I'm not good at this. I have to figure this out. And it was that grind and that maintaining my confidence that brought me full circle. Um, to the moment where I got introduced to Dan and Tanya. Um, I was actually pitching them to help the team as a consultant. I wasn't looking for a job. And they asked me to interview after the pitch. And um, and I ended up getting the job and starting shortly after. And so, so pitch? Yeah, it was, yeah, pitch of my life, apparently. Pitch of my life, apparently. <laughs> but it's been an amazing privilege. And all those things that I learned early on of 
being able to maintain your confidence, have clarity of vision and purpose, even when everything around you feels chaotic, people are telling you you're going the wrong direction. You do make mistakes and you have to recover from them. You have to take ownership of them, but then move things forward. It's been, this has been a, a culmination of all of those experiences and it's been the privilege of a lifetime to lead us through this really tumultuous but beautiful moment um, for, the, for the organization. Well, I don't know if these two have noticed just yet, but we, we don't only have the president here. We also, if you notice in the background, have the king as well. Your family has a lot of tradition with the civil rights movement. In fact, your middle name has, uh, has some influence on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're the first black president of an NFL franchise. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about how, you know, that upbringing, you said, you're, you know, that maybe the rules, you know, you got to be a little lax there. Yeah. Uh, but obviously there were some good things done for you because you're in a position right now of first of your kind. Now there's five mm -hmm. uh, and Washington has one of, if not the most diverse kind of front offices in the NFL, you know, walk us through how your upbringing kind of helped you get to sure. where you are and and kind of help those around you in, in shaping the NFL. Yeah, I mean, my parents, um, both sides, both of their families, so both sides of my, um, my family were involved in the civil rights movement. And the the focus was really through education and economic empowerment. You know, like the Gomillion versus Lightfoot case, which is my middle name, that case in South Carolina, mm -hmm. um, was focused on uh, uh, racial gerrymandering uh, for voting districts. Actually, an evergreen topic today that sure, you can't, sorry. you know, carve out voting districts based on race to try to disenfranchise one person over another, or give more power to um, one demographic than another in a voting block. Um, you know, that was what you know uh, um, Charles Good um tried against the Supreme Court. Um, and then on my dad's side, I got a ton of educators as well. You know, my uncle was a professor at a historically black college and university. Uh, um, my grandfather was a teacher before becoming a founder of the NAACP chapters in East Texas. And like that, it was always about education and economic empowerment. And my parents' mantra was the way that you drive greater equity in the world is to get greater influence and greater resources so that you can um, do things in a more fair and equitable way you go get influence and then you do that. You, you role model a different way of leading. And they always said, we want our ceiling economically to be your floor, Jason, and your ceiling to be your kid's floor and so on and so forth. And that's how economic power grows. That's how generational wealth is created, et cetera. So that's a little bit of like what I heard um, coming through. And then you fast forward that the through line on my career has been at each stop. I focused on various aspects of um, education and economic empowerment, whether that was the work I did in the off seasons when I was in the league, starting charter schools, and things like that, all the way through to my work at McKinsey, running a think tank of economists that focused on racial equity in the economy, um, and to now where the intersection of diverse perspectives and the health of a business and the productivity of a football team all intersect. Because we don't do this diversity thing for performative issues. I, I, I find that stuff sort of demeaning and pedantic and ain't nobody got time for that because we actually had real things that we needed to do in this organization, right? We didn't have time to sort of do performative stuff. Um, it's about the fact that our fan base is one of the most diverse in the NFL. That's politically, that's racially, that's by gender. We have one of the largest quotients of female season ticket holders in the entire mm -hmm. NFL. Um, and it's also socioeconomically. We, we span a larger range than many of the other teams in the NFL. Part of that is our ticketing price point, which is a bit lower than others, especially for a market like ours. So the socioeconomics of our fan base span a big spectrum. So if we don't have diverse perspectives in the building that are proximate and close and can easily access the mindsets of our fans, we're not going to get to good answers. Mm -hmm. Data analytics take you a little bit, but you got to have folks in the room. And then the decision-making process in general, and this is where Coach has done a really good job, any decision-making process benefits from people who think differently and have different backgrounds being in on that because you point out each other's blind spots. You know, that, that's one of the, the, the great things about Coach bringing in uh, Eric bien -Aimé. right? Eric bien -Aimé comes from outside of the system that Ron and them have worked with for a couple decades. It's an intentional move to catalyze a different way of thinking and a different mode of thinking 
in the building, different perspectives that can come into conflict. Sometimes that can create heat, but that heat can also create light, illumination and insight. And um, that's why we do it. Um, we, and we had to do it because, again, we had to turn this place around. We had to change the type of people who are here. We had to build some momentum to rebuild the season ticket member base, which had ebbed over the last decade. Um, and for Ron, we have to do it because we absolutely have to win. Mm -hmm. There's no more. There's no more runway. It's win. It's it's time to win. Um, and so um, that's why we're all in on diversity. It's not performative. It's it's for outcomes. Yeah. And, and along those same lines, Jason, uh, I'm putting up a photo here with you and Martin Mayhew and Eric Bieniemy and Ron Rivera. What does that what does that photo mean to you? Uh, what I love about it, um, and if you added if you added Jack to the mix, the the top five people in the organization are all former players. Hmm. And um, and when you have five former players like running the day to day of the organization across the board, there's a common language. There's a um, built in level of understanding that's derived from shared experience that allows us to work more seamlessly with less of the politics, less of the Game of Thrones that can exist in some of these organizations where um, we all know how to be good teammates. We all know how to lend to each other's strengths. We know how to have really direct and productive debate when we need to. Um, that's number one. It gives me confidence in what we need to do and we're going to have tough moments in the next year while we have a lot of success. Um, you know, we're on the precipice of some really good things on, on every side of this organization um, that we're, we're gonna be able to navigate those thorny moments that will inevitably arise um, because we have that shared experience. And then the fact that it's um, four men of color in that picture mm -hmm. and a time when um, most across the NFL ecosystem say might say it's so hard to find black and brown leadership for roles, so hard to find qualified people, yada, yada, yada. Um, it shows that sort of where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I think, um, you know, for us, we, we would pride ourselves in trying to take a very rigorous and dispassionate approach to evaluating talent. Um, and when that happens, you start to see a more representative example of leadership. And you know, while 70% of the NFL looks like the guys on in that picture, it makes sense that a large quotient of the leadership of our organization would as well. To piggyback on that, uh, Jason, what motivates you? You probably already answered this in your story so far, but what motivates you to get up every day and want to come to work as the team president for Washington Commanders? You know, it's shifted over time. I think when I first got here, it was like, man, the challenge of all this, the complexity, it was like an intellectual exercise. And then pretty quickly through engagement with the fans, through starting to bring on a workforce that had like the right values and mindset, it became about the people that we're stewarding on this, on, on, on stewarding this franchise on behalf of. Like this place has, we, we have to win in this franchise. Mm -hmm. The entire area um, has a different bounce in its step. <laughs> There's a different level of cooperation and enthusiasm, even in civic engagement in this area when this team is doing well and is a team that people can be proud of in the way that it operates and conducts business and shows up in the community, the way the players carry themselves and represent the area. There's, there's something uniquely special about this organization for this area. And this area is uniquely influential across the world. Um, and, and so for us, we've taken on this um, very almost aspirational mission of like, we got to fix our stuff. We have to have an organization we can all be proud of. We have to win consistently on the field because, and it's, no, it's nothing due to us. It's because of the history of this place. None of us, none of us established this capital. Right. We're, we're riding on it, right? We're riding on the backs of it. It's the alumni. It's uh, the long history of winning here. It's the history of civic engagement and investment in the communities here um, over the years. Like that's what we're riding on. So it's not us. We're not getting credit for it. But because that exists, we can have this aspirational mission that by doing right and by winning consistently on the field, we can have a big impact on how we talk to each other in society, in the tone and tenor of the dialogue in the nation's capital, 
um, in a new venue project and the things that we can do on the horizon, showing a way to do social impact and economic development in an inclusive way that also drives a lucrative business forward and creates world-class facilities for our guys and our fans. But there's so much that can be done because we're in the nation's capital um, and because of the influence that's inherent there and the power of this franchise, even though the winning hasn't been there consistently, it still exists. It's just a, a sleeping giant. That is, uh, the alarm's gone off. Earlier, you mentioned, you know, you kind of do receive some vitriol when it comes to social media. And, and uh, obviously, over your tenure, there's been some good things and some bad things. Now, typically, I like to say positive. And, and so I do want you to end with, you know, something you're proud of. But yeah. could you t maybe go over something that you that happened during your time that you wish you could just do over that you kind of wish the things had gone differently? So many. There's so many. I mean, whether it's, um, I mean, there, there are things that like, I would do differently. There are things that I would do differently um, across the way. You know, um, I can get a bit enthusiastic in defending our players. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. I think it's an important signal to um, our players that we're, we in the front office are always going to have their backs. I love that. Wow. Can, and, yeah, and I will continue to do it. But, you know, I, you know, I could do it a bit differently. Um, than I have before, you know, I don't need to go off on pro football talk or various media. It's never, it's, ne it's never productive to pick fights. Mm. With I mean, you can come on this platform if you need to. I mean, yeah, it's never <laughs> productive to do that. Cause everyone's just trying to do their jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. It's never productive to do that. Um, uh, but I'll still find a way to defend our guys. Cause one of our core values is family, family impact, growth, honor, trust are our five core values that Ron and I established across the organization. And the one about family is thinking about people outside of yourself. It's sticking your neck out sacrificially on their side for your teammate. It's to do your assignment so your teammate can succeed. You know, stay in your gap, stay in your lane, and your other teammate makes the play. For us on the business side, it's thinking outside of my business silo. I'm not thinking just about my incentives or my comp, but I'm thinking about how I make marketing successful, operations successful. And for me, I think about, yes, I'm on the business side, but it's important for the titular head of the organization to show very vocal defense of our players uh, when they're out there, when they're out there and they're vulnerable and we need them to feel protected and uh, confident mm -hmm. and perform well, right? Um, so I think that's something I would do with more tact and more grace. Um, I think, um, you know, we have, we've had so much um, going on that um, at times we've had execution lack and um, in game day activations as we've learned the stadium, um, we've had to disco discover and fix a lot of broken things. And when you do that, you can have missteps in, edu in, in execution. And um, I think one of the things that I would do is I'd give my team um, more of my time and support, you know, um, because I'm asking a lot of them. I'm asking them to transform a culture. I'm asking that I mean, we've turned over 80 plus percent of the organization since I decided. Wow. It's not something I ever would have recommended as a consultant, but was absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. to establish the right people, the right values, upstanding way of working, not perfect by any means. I mean, we're talking about the mistakes right now. Right. Um, but I'm asking a lot of them to reestablish culture, to establish new ways of working. Heck, we built an HR department from scratch. We rebuilt, like we, we, mm -hmm. like we, we professionalized the business, stuff that's unsexy and uninteresting to most fans. Mm -hmm. Critical to establishing a, a, a foundation on which you can build a championship. Um, you know, doing those things is a lot to do while also turning around the sales trajectory of the season ticket member base while trying to grow sponsorship when there is a negative news article every other week about the team, asking a lot of my team. And so it makes sense that stuff that should normally be executed to with I's dotted and T's crossed may fall through the cracks because I'm asking them to do all of that and three other jobs at the same time. Mm. So have benefited from more timeline, more support, um, more um, more leeway from me to say, you can do less. You can do less here. Let's push out the timeline on things. But I tend to be, um, I tend to drive hard. I tend to push our team. I really believe in the human capacity to do more than you think you're capable of doing. I mean, heck, that was my whole NFL career around four, six, right? Like. I just, should have been nowhere near anything. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and so I just I have this firm belief just based on my own inadequacies as a football player and yet having a seven year career. like, Hey, we're capable of a lot more than we think we are. Um, but you need grace and lenience and breaks and rhythm as well. You can't drive hard all the time. Um, so I think some of the breakdowns in execution, especially during the season when things are getting tired and we're doing things week to week are due to that. Um, but then I think the thing I'm most proud of is what has happened on some of those core aspects. You know, we did. We literally changed the face of the organization. Like, it is literally not the organization it was before. Whether that's the people that are here, mm -hmm. ways of working, the way we engage with our sponsors and partners, the way that um, the people in the DC community, the business leaders in the Greater Washington Partnership, the Economic Club of DC, the DC Board of Trade see us and feel about us is 180 degrees different than it was before. And that sets the stage for great things um, down the road um, as we go through this moment of, of transition. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm proud that we are the most diverse leadership team in the NFL. Um, I think 47% of our whole workforce are people of color, which mirrors the area and uh, the demographics of the area, which is important, again, for the success of the business. I'm, I'm very proud of that. and. Then, all of that, I'm, I'm most proud that that has proven to move the business forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like to talk about where um, the season ticket member base was because it's just really bad. I know the number in my head, maybe one day I'll say it publicly, but I never say it on the record. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll tell you all when we're off the record. Off the record. <laughs> when we got here, 47% you know, of our tickets were going through brokers. That's just completely outsourcing the love and care and attention of your fan base and mm -hmm. that's how you have a season ticket member base combined with not winning that people are like why do i buy this ticket when the person next to me bought it for five dollars yesterday mm -hmm. you're 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 undermining the season ticket holder and that sacred trust that you have to build with them and so we did the hard work to pull that back and slowly start to rebuild our season ticket member base we're now only about 15 percent of our tickets go through brokers and we've done the hard work of making sure we don't undermine our season ticket holders value or they're getting the most value for it even though we already have really low prices relative to the rest of the nfl and certainly the wealth in this market like we've still held them there um uh, because we we need to hold the value for our season ticket member base um and so uh, that hard work um has gotten us to a point where we almost tripled from where the season ticket member base was when we started now we still have a long way to go Right. We still have a long way to go to fill the stadium. Um, so it's it's nowhere near mission accomplished. But I'm really proud that when you can look at the hard numbers, which we're doing now, um, especially at this moment of transition, those numbers are front and center. The momentum is real. Um, I'm really proud that in the face of, you know, just a, a, a um, what's the what's the right word? A deluge of um, of, of negative articles and headlines that have um, been endemic over the last couple of years, that we've still been able to grow sponsorship 14% year over year and grown in that space where you think that would hurt the most. And we mm -hmm. signed the largest sponsorship deal in team history, larger than our naming rights deal with SeatGeek this last year. Um, but it's because these folks are seeing the organization that we built. They're seeing the type of people that are working here now. They're engaging with us and they're like, you know what? Like, the stuff they were saying before, we weren't sure if it was true. It, it sure does feel true now. It sure does feel true now. We're willing to place a bet. Um, and it, it's about to get even better. I tell you what, man, I'm ready to run through a brick wall. On All right. kind of thing. Give like, me the form for the season tickets. I'm ready right that. now. Let's Give me the <laughs> Please, they're not even that expensive. I promise no, you. No, they're not. So I tell folks, like, especially like where we, where we want to focus now. Like last year, the focus was on the club section. Like there are certain areas where we're, we're pretty sold through. But we're pretty sold through and in those places like your whole price steady you even increase price a little bit like that's you do normal business um but we you know we're not doing anything crazy out of whack the, the terrace tables that we did last year like those yeah. sold through like crazy so we were able to like yeah those were cool so that you know there's pricing power there but in most places last year we focused on the club area because that's the area when you looked at it on game day it just looks so sparse and empty you know we did new chairs there and we couldn't really take price down any further. We were already like the lowest price in the NFL mm -hmm. in this market for those seats. But then we said, we're going to do all-inclusive food and all-inclusive parking. 
mm -hmm. with that ticket, which added some value to it. And we started to fill out that space. That's where our biggest growth was last year. I think it was over 5,000 season tickets in that area alone mm. last year. And, and we'll have another big growth issue. But now I want us to focus on the upper bowl, mm -hmm. uh, the cheap seats up top. Mm -hmm. Still a great view at no, FedEx, no. but you can get you can get upper bowl season tickets for less than four hundred dollars for the whole season. Hmm. The whole season. That's yeah. like that's how much like pricing power there is for the fan. Like it is not a high bar to entry. And look, like if and if that feels still like it's a lot. Um, I promise you, you'd be able to make that back on a couple games if you had to, right? Like, mm -hmm. like it's a, it's, it's a worthy, it's a worthy I don't want that. I don't want y'all selling y'all tickets. No. Like, that's the barrier. Especially to opposing fans. Yeah, yes. no way. That's the barrier. I'd rather you be there for a majority of the games to give us that home field advantage that we had on that Sunday night against the Giants. Mm -hmm. I feel like that was a real inflection point for us. Yes. All the work our sales teams had done, the marketing teams had done, again, not perfect. But we had rebuilt to a point where we were at an inflection point. And I think if we win that game, mm. take oh. off. Mm. We'll get there again. Yeah, yeah. we were there in a suite. We had a we had a giveaway, got a got yep. a suite and gave a ticket to one of our viewers. And uh it was quite the experience up there. My yeah, wife and I, great. uh club level season ticket holders up until uh this uh this season were mm -hmm. not because we're gonna be moving away. Uh but uh mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's it's a good experience and we've appreciated what you've kind of done in that way yeah. uh you know if we were to kind of you know look to the future is there yeah. you know for commuting purposes do you have any kind of insight on, on that one <laughs> look, look, i'm sorry jason I'm I, sorry. Love, I, love, I love how i love how you you, you so woke right that's what he does jason, he's a new, so a smooth new venue, a new venue question by talking about commuting that's very dc <laughs> that's right um uh, the, the the advantage of um, this area is that you really do have great partners across Maryland, DC, and Virginia. They're the leaders across all of them, whether it's the mayors and governors, the county executives, the county council members, the city council members. There's a good balance of a drive towards social impact and um, and and good economics in a business that has to be profitable. Like we're a business, right? We got we got to we got to run in the black. Like this, mm -hmm. it's not it's not you just don't just have a a consistent funder just un underwrite mm -hmm. the business. It needs to be in the black. It needs to operate. And that's why when folks invest in sweet season tickets, it allows us to invest in Ron, right? A lucrative business is able to invest, you know, and that's what the best teams do. They have a high powered business that then can invest in the football side and generate a championship. And it's a virtuous cycle from there. Um, but we have great leaders um, across the region and we have amazing opportunities um, across the region. Um, everything else beyond that got to stay hush and private because <laughs> all these leaders are sticking their political necks out to mm -hmm. try to do what's best for their constituents. And we will always do our part. I can't promise everybody else will around it. There's lots of whispers and uh, media is quite nosy. Um, but we will always do our part to, um, uh, to, remain, to maintain uh, discretion. But, but, no, but I think people can know this. No, number one, we see ourselves as participants following those leaders and their economic development plans. Um, and they all have a vision for what they want to create that has benefits for uh, their constituents. That's number one. Number two is we have a very hyper local approach, both in the folks that we want to use to build and develop uh, that new venue complex. It should benefit local businesses, mm -hmm. especially veteran owned. Black owned, brown owned, women owned businesses in the area, which we have a plethora of here that are looking for that opportunity to do something at scale. It's an opportunity to do something really unique there. Um, and both that and in the way it's operated. If you think about a larger retail complex, it, should, it shouldn't it should be big box, like Bass Pro Shops and stuff like that. It should be local folks mm. that when you walk into the new venue or around the new venue, it feels like you're in the DMV. Um, whether it's the music, the food, the uh, uh, the signage and the art, it should feel like it's here, not like you could be anywhere plopped down. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that we're absolutely committed to, as well as achieving the social impact aims of the area, whether that's educational infrastructure or green space. Like We'll be on board with whatever folks want. Um, this is an opportunity where we as stewards of um, 
of a pillar institution in the area need to get aligned and behind what um, political and um, community leaders want to do. Man, Jason, we could ask you uh, a billion questions about so one. many things, right? Uh, this is my last one, and I and is, mine's going to be a real quick answer. Yep. Uh, is the team going to win 13 games or 14 games? This oh, I like it. I like that story. Which point. one? Either 13 no. or 14, or you can go higher if you want. You just mm. can't go lower. Yeah, I mean, how can I not say 14 if you give me a choice? Right? <laughs> At I mean, least. Like, yeah, I got to gotta round up. I got to round up. No, I, I I am confident in the guys. You know, every every, every year is different. And, you know, some of the teams, yeah, the salary cap is a beautiful thing and that it creates parity in the NFL. No team is ever that far away from going from laggard to leader. And I think um, Ron and Marty and Martin and – Eric Stokes and Chris Polian have built a really strong foundation on the roster. And now we've catalyzed it with new coaching talent. Um, it's an opportunity for us. This is a leap year for us. It's a leap forward year for us. But some of our competition this year has made a leap forward. You know, we've got the Bears at home this year. We've got the Dolphins at home this year. Very active. They are not standing pat. You know, while some of our folks in division because of salary cap constraints are offloading right now, you know, um, in fact, all of them are in some way, shape, or form, restructuring and offloading. They still have super strong rosters, and they're thoughtful, and they have um, great talent strategists. So it's not like it's the the degree of difficulty doesn't get easier right. going in, even though we're going to make a step forward. But I'm 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 really confident. Um, I'm really confident in our guys, and I think everybody understands um, that it's um, that's this is a this is a burn the bridge year. Like we are crossing that bridge. We are going into battle into this season, and we are burning the bridge behind us. That's burning cool. the boat behind us. That was like my big question: was like, it's, how? It's, so it's a win. It's it, it is a it is a win or bust year, right? Okay. Um, uh, we we believe in our strategy. We believe in our direction, and I have a ton of confidence um, in coaching guys. Of course, so many things can happen. Right. God forbid injuries and health and all of the idiosyncratic things that can happen. Put your prayers up for that, burn your incense, do your sage, whatever whatever your flavor is. Do yeah. that so that it helps us and put positive energy behind us, which I, you know, I do believe in. Um, um, I do believe in putting that positive sentiment behind it uh, for those things you can't control. But uh, for the things we can control, we are well positioned. And that's why I'm not afraid to speak so boldly in support of those guys. That's what my question was, was the biggest difference that we can look forward to from last year to this year. But you kind of already answered it. And then by waiting around and going to get EB and doing this kind of shows that we ain't playing this year. Like we're being more aggressive. Is that the biggest difference that we can look forward I think to? This so. year? I think so. And I think, you you know, you you see you see roster building happening right now, right. even with the moves the last couple of days. Right. This is a methodical roster building approach that's been thought through strategically and um, they're executing it um, um, uh, even uh, to a greater degree this year um, right. according to the plan that they've had in place for some time and I do think EB is uh, an important addition and um, he's a high accountability coach um, mm -hmm. he is a very no-nonsense coach I think for a lot of the guys it's going to be a natural transition you know the Terry's of the world yeah like like you saw how he responded to it. I don't mind being coached hard. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an adjustment for some guys. Mm -hmm. be no, I know how everybody's geeked and happy about this. But <laughs> wait till training camp. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be. And I'm excited about that. Yeah. Because EB is smart. He's compassionate. He understands the needs of the player. But, but he's going to tell you the truth. He's going to tell you the truth. He's going to make decisions based on performance and um, – and he's going to demand a lot of guys, both in the pace of practice and um, uh, the uh, the discipline mentally that he requires of guys is very high. And I think that edge, what that's going to bring to the practice field, what that's going to bring to the locker room, um, what that's going to bring to the overall building. Frankly, I look I, I look forward to it rubbing off on my folks mm -hmm. They're walking through and they see a discipline an edge, um, a high accountability feeling in the air. I want that to rub off on my folks too. So I am, I am really excited to see how that materializes. And, um, you know, and Jack has his own style of coaching and demanding accountability. It's a little slightly different in personality, but obviously he's done a fantastic job rallying mm -hmm. that locker room, 
through so many things over the last year that could have torn apart that defense and got to good production. And so I think Ron has the right people and we got to let them be themselves and do their thing. And, and we're going to support them as best we can. Well, I know a lot of people are excited. These two included for uh, potentially some hard knocks. So we get to see some of that in person. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see what comes with that. And uh, just kind of trying to like, read the face. Yeah. 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 I like keep, that grin. Trying to keep a, a little stone <laughs> on that one. Um, uh, the uh, last question uh, for you mm -hmm. before we have to let you go, because we know we've uh, kind of monopolized your time here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you got to get back to Ron and the team. I actually got to get to FedEx, actually. So, wow. There you go. So is last Lamar question for you. You've, you've kind of, it seems like your legacy for Washington is kind of going to be set around that diversity thing. But so what's Jason's right legacy in life? What do you want that to be? Hmm. I want to, I want it to be um, that I was able to show through the people I assembled, uh, the impact I had through the organizations I led, um, the things that you see in the outcomes of the business and the things you don't see in how I and others that I bring in engage with people in the community, that a team of folks that looks different than people expect can outperform the teams of folks that look like everybody expected. Hmm. I, I want us to show um, that you can win a championship built differently. I want to show that you can build a lucrative business built differently. Um, and I want that to open the door for more talent to be able to have um, positions of influence across sports, media, entertainment um, uh, in a way that improves the whole industry and brings more health to the entire industry. And I want us to become eventually known as the factory for great talent across sports, media, and entertainment. A little bit of that has happened. You know, my first chief legal officer, Damon Jones, is now the number two at the Dodgers. You know, he was a Hall of Fame college baseball player. When that job, he was up for the Seattle Mariners president job, and that one didn't go. And then I knew it was just a matter of time. And he went and and, and got that role. He's the you know he's the assistant GM at the Dodgers now. You know, runs all their amazing analytics department and all of that stuff. And we still talk and I'm still supportive of him. He's still supportive of us. You know, Dave Baldwin, who is really the driver of our revenue turnaround and our season ticket member base, now the president of the Chicago Fire. Mm -hmm. um, like we, I want us to become a talent factory. Now, right now it sucks when people are leaving because I'm like, come on, man, we got to go through a transition. Like I need to here. but I celebrate it. But I celebrate it because it's, it's what we always intended. It's like, I mean, a few months from now would have been better. <laughs> right. Um, um, but it's great. And I celebrate that. And I want us over the years, five years, seven years down the road to have executives leading organizations all over sports media entertainment that tie themselves back to this organization at this juncture mm -hmm. uh, that led this, you know, sort of against all odds um, in in the face of much criticism um, that most of the time had nothing to do with anybody that's been here. All right. Um, but you brave it anyway, because we're, we're, we shoulder it now. We shoulder it now. And um, I want to I, I want us to have that legacy. Very nice. Well, thank you again, Jason. Right. This is the president of I need a the I'm ready. Guys in the NFL, the Washington Commanders. We appreciate you jumping on here with us on Ref the Districts after the whistle. I'm Nathan. That's Trev. That's the stoner. And of course, that's President Jason Wright. And until next time. Mm. See you guys. Ah, be a fan. I like it. What's up, guys? Thanks for watching. Trevor here, one third of Ref the District. Be sure to like and subscribe this channel for us, please. We greatly appreciate it. And after that, take a look at some of this extra stuff we got on our channel, too. You don't want to miss it. And always, be a fan.